The four horsemen of Notre Dame are four men who made up the winning players at Notre Dame under coach Newt Rockney. Harry Stoldreyer was the quarterback, Jim Crowley was the left halfback, Don Miller was the right halfback, and Elmer Layden was the fullback. During the three years that the group played, Notre Dame only lost two games, both to Nebraska. It is said that the four of them made up the greatest backfield in history. These four men were immortalized by sports writer Grant Landrice in his account of the Notre Dame Army game for the New York Curl Tribune. This piece is thought of as the most famous piece in history of sports journalism. Rice gave them the nickname, the Force Horsemen of Notre Dame. The articles were written about the game on the afternoon of October 18, 1924, when Notre Dame beat Army 13-17, to with over 55,000 spectators watching. Rice started off with a dramatic beginning by portraying the scene. Outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the War Horsemen rode again. In dramatic lore, they are known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. George Strickler, the team's publicity aide, wanted to make sure that the name the Four Horsemen stuck. He posed the four men dressed in uniform on horseback. Newspapers printed the photo, and the legend was made. The men had a, men had a tremendous impact of American citizens. They made college football a popular event to watch and follow loyally. At the time, I didn't realize the impact it would have. Curly said later, but the th thing just kind of mushroomed. After the splurge in the press, the sports fans of the nation got interested in us along with other sports writers. Our record helped too. If we lost a couple, I don't think we would have been remembered. All four men started coaching careers after graduating, and they were all elected to the National Football Hall of Fame by 1970. The men are so widely known and celebrated today. In the year 1919, the Chicago White Sox and the Cincinnati Reds were competing against each other in the World Series. The White Sox players were unhappy with the team owner, Charles Kaminsky, and decided to fix the World Series. The White Sox first baseman, Chick Gandley, led the conspiracy. With the help of the famous New York gambler, Arnold Rothstein, Gandel promised the White Chicago White Sox pitchers, Eddie Chicotti, and Lefty Williams, the third baseman, Buck Weaver, the shortstop, Swede Risberg, the utility infielder, Fred McMullen, and the outfielders, Oscar Happy Flesh, and Joe Jackson, $20,000 to double cross and lose every game in the World Series. Before the World Series started, it was predicted that the White Sox would beat the Reds 3-1. to one. However, it did not turn out that way. In the first game, Kakadi pitched and let the Reds win the game 9-1. to one. After the game was over, Gandel did not gave the players the dough they were expecting to receive after losing the game. In the second game, William pitched. The Reds won 4-2, to two, and the Gandal still did not give the players their money. Dickie Carr, a pitcher not part of the conspiracy, pitched the third game, and the White Sox won the game 3-0. to zero. The White Sox, Sox lost the fourth game 2-0 to zero, and the fifth game 5-0 to zero, and still did not receive their promised $20,000. The players involved in the fix were mad about not receiving their dough and decided to no longer purposely lose the games. Also, the team owner, Kaminsky, promised the team players a bonus if they won the World Series. However, the World Series ended in the eighth game with the White Sox defeated. In 1920, allegations of the fix led to the start of the grand jury investigation of the events that took place in 1919 World Series. Chicotti and Jackson were the first to admit their involvement in the World Series fix in the, in the court case Illinois v. Edward v. Chicotti et al. began. The court knew that the defendants participated in said games as players conspired, confederated, and agreed together with the defendants not participate. Therein to so conduct themselves throughout the said games, and each of said games, and so manipulate their playing in each of said games as to make certain advance of the playing of said games. The outcome thereof, and the win thereof, as to make certain advance of the playing of all games of said series in the outcome majority of the games of said series, and the winner majority of said games. However, the testimony that led to these indictments disappeared before the trial, and the White Sox players, part of the conspiracy, were adequated due to lack of evidence. Even though the White Sox players involved in the World Series fix of 1919 were never in trouble by law, Kaminsky fired the eight players involved in the conspiracy and swore that the Med would never play professional baseball again. 
George Herman Babe Ruth was born on February 6, 1895 in Baltimore, Maryland and died on August 16, 1948 in New York, New York. Babe's father was a second generation German salon proprietor and didn't care much for Babe. Babe was forced by the city of Baltimore to go to St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys. At St. Mary's Industrial School, Priest Xavierin realized Babe's passion and talent for baseball. With Xavierin's help, Babe was one of the best pitching prospects in Baltimore at the age of 14. Brother Matthias from St. Mary's Industrial School got Babe a trial for the competitive minor league Baltimore Orleans of the International League. He made the team and earned a salary of 600 rubles a year. The nickname Babe came about during his first month with the Orleans in an interview with a reporter. One of the coaches suggested that Babe is the biggest and most promising Babe in the lot. On July 11, 1914, the Boston Red Sox were impressed by Babe's performance on the field and Ball's contract for the, from the Baltimore Orleans. Babe started his 22-year career by pitching and winning his first game for the Boston Red Sox. Between the years 1914 and 1919, Babe won 95 games as a pitcher for the Red Sox, and in the 1916 and 1918 World Series, Babe pitched 29 and two-thirds consecutive scoreless innings. Even though Babe was the cat's meow in the pitching world, in 1919 he became an outfielder and a strong hitter. Later that year, the New York Yankees felt Babe was ducky and bought Babe for a record high salary of $125,000 a year. As a big six, Babe's performance drastically changed how baseball is played and watched. Babe set records for home runs, extra base hits, runs batted in, runs scored, walks, and strikeouts. Those weren't the only records set. The Yankees set attendance records at both at home and away games. Even in all of his success, Babe promoted alcohol and drinking at sports games. Babe wanted alcohol to be legal and accessible. Babe himself drank quite a lot and once said, it's simple, kids. If you drink and smoke and eat and screw as much as me, well, kiddos, someday you'll be just as good at sports. Prohibition was a huge movement during the 1920s, and everything about Babe and baseball games contradicted their beliefs. Many men would go to sports games and consume large amounts of alcohol. Babe turned the American League Club into the most famous sport franchise in the United States. Yankee Stadium became known as the house that Ruth built. After winning 110 games and the World Series, the Yankees became known as the greatest baseball team of all time. Babe's most famous hit of his career was during the 1932 World Series. Babe apparently called his home run, pointing in the direction of the center field wall. According to the story, Babe hit the ball over the fence where he had pointed. At the end of Babe's career, he had more World Series appearances than any other player. In retirement, Babe was honored by becoming one of the five original inductees to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Corpustown, New York. Babe's number was retired by the Yankees in 1948 before his death later that year. At Babe's funeral, thousands of people gathered in a crowd to pay respects to one of the most popular sports figures in America and baseball. On September 30th, the next to last day of the season, and needing just one more home run, he faced Tom Zachary of the Washington Senators. The first Zachary offering was a fast one which sailed over for a call strike. The next was high. The babe took a vicious swing at the third pitch ball and the bat connected with a crash that was audible in all parts of the stand. While the crowd cheered and the Yankee players roared their greeting, the babe made his triumphant, almost regal tour of the paths. And when he embedded his spikes in the rubber disc to officially Homer 60, hats were tossed in the air, papers were torn up and tossed liberally, and the spirit of celebration permeated the place. Sixty, count them, sixty, Ruth shouted in the locker room. Let's see some other son of a bitch match that. <laughs> 